name is Lauren Pyle. I am the Outdoor Recreation Grants Manager for the state of Vermont for the Forest Parks and Recreation team. And so today you are here for our off open office hours. Uh, and today's theme is specifically around construction projects. And these projects might show up in the implementation track. We're having questions about the outdoor equity track as well as the flood recovery track. So this is our one office hour session where it's all things construction across those three tracks for the first 30 minutes. And then depending on the flow of the conversation for the final 30 minutes of our session, it'll be open Q&A about anything and everything grants uh, that you would like to talk about as related to the Warwick Community Grant Program. And so for those of you hopping on, I'll just do one more quick intro. My name is Lauren Pyle. I'm the Outdoor Recreation Grants Manager. Uh, and so I'll be facilitating today's open office session. We do ask that today that you stay on mute, except when it is uh, your opportunity to ask a question. So you're welcome to ask a question uh, one of three ways. One is you can drop it into the chat at any time and we'll go through. You can use the raise hand function within Teams. It looks like the little hand icon and then we'll call on people as we go. Or if it's kind of a lull in the conversation, you're like, this is it. It's happening. Just go ahead and unmute and it's all you. Um, so we're going to go ahead and try to answer as many questions as you can. And it's really about you today. And so with that, um, I will open it up and let you all get started. Oh, sorry. One more pause. This meeting is being recorded. You probably got the notification from Teams. So this meeting is being recorded. We plan to post the recording on the website afterwards for those who could not make it today. And so now. Who would like to kick us off with our first question of the day? All right, I see a hand up there, a, a camera hand. So that is uh, Zoning Administrator is your name uh, showing up on Teams today. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, Tom Badowski with the Town of Berlin. I will have uh, one of many questions for you, Lauren. So um, on, we're doing a land acquisition and one of the the first questions is acquisition type it's fee acquisition or fee acquisition with an easement we have a unique uh, uh, project here where we're partnering uh, with a solar developer that has a permit for a 20-year solar farm and so it's not an easement but it's a lease so we want to buy 94 acres 20 of it, which will be in solar farm for 20 years, and then the town will have complete 94 acres. So which one do I, I which one do I check here? Fee acquisition or free fee acquisition with a easement? It's not an easement, but it's a lease. That's a great question. And Claire Pulfus is also with us today. So Claire is the recreation programs manager for Vermont FPR. Uh, and Claire, I'm going to tag you in on this one. Sure. Um it sounds to me like that's an in fee that you are acquiring the land in fee for the town and it has an existing lease on that land so i would put in fee um it is a unique situation and we will you know review it as needed um beyond well, that question when you say in fee that is fee acquisition correct fee acquisition yes sorry all right, thank you very much for that question, for taking us the first one. Who's got the next question that you'd like to share today? It might help if all of you guys who do have questions, thanks Brett, that if you just put your hand up, then we can move through them instead of asking each time. So everyone um, who has a question, just please click the raise your hand. Um, that would help us facilitate. Thanks, Claire. So, Brett, you're the next one up. Yeah, uh, nice to meet everyone. I'm, my name is Brett. I'm with CRO Planning and Design, looking into a project development grant. And I just wanted to confirm that project development grant oh, dollars and can go dollars. towards uh, permitting and <clears throat> the cost for permits. I see engineering costs and contracting, but not permits specifically. So I just wanted to double check with that. 
Yes, the permit cost should be an eligible expense within this. So, and that's permit cost as related to, you know, any of the state pieces. If you have to, uh, you know, depending on for your project development piece, if you're going to have an archaeological resource assessment, the ARAs um, for historical resources compliance, that could potentially be something that we could talk about or include. Um, but yes, those permitting costs are eligible expenses. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Looks like uh, next up is Sharon. And you, oh, hi, you yeah, <laughs> just, um, hi, I'm Sharon Panich. I'm with Vermont Common School, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and we're not in session today, so I'm home in my sweatshirt. Um, but we will be applying for an implementation grant. And I have a couple of probably pretty simple questions. I'm just starting to familiarize myself with the uh, grant application right now. Um, so with the um, project activity description, so we have we a piece of land that we own. Um, and we are in the process of doing a, a build out of low impact. Um, development so a trail system um a boardwalk over some wetlands we're hoping to put in a couple of yurts um composting toilets things like that um to expand our ability to uh, study the land and steward it and um so there there are multiple pieces some of which are already in process but um for project activities would we want to break down um, each of those specific uh, build outs. So trail system would be one activity, creating a learning pavilion would be another, um, and then and then build a timeline for using each each individual component. And so, Sharon, if I could ask a clarifying question, are you specifically talking about the time to build your work plan? Like that's the piece that you're asking about is specifically the work plan? Yes, um, yes. I would say for that, to bundle them in a way that is cohesive for your project. And I know that that is uh, not just me trying to hedge my bets and not answer the question, um, but what are the steps that are there? Because there could be something that says, you know, like uh, you mentioned building the yurt, is yeah. that, a lot of steps to get to building your yurt or is that sign the contract with the yurt company and let them install it because those are really different scopes of work right in terms of how you're doing that because if you have these multiple simple single line activities like bundle them together tell us the big picture as you're putting it together but if you're saying well we're working on the yurts and then like this is step one this is step two this is step three this is step four yurts is a bundle of activities and now we're going to go to composting toilet. It's a whole different set of activities with a whole different group of people. Like, let's call that out and be separate. And so just as you're trying to build the work plan, we're not trying to put it to say like, oh, it must be in this bucket, um, but yeah. put it into what feels like you can tell the story and that somebody else who is not on this call and who isn't familiar with your project could look at it and follow along. Uh, a, a strategy I often recommend uh, to folks as like as you're building a work plan or even review it, developing your grant application is if you have like a colleague or a, even a family member, a friend who is outside of the project before you submit it, if you can share that with them to have that outside perspective, they might be able to raise a lot of the same questions that our reviewers are going to raise to say, this doesn't make sense to me as someone who isn't as intimately familiar with the project, what can it be? And so that being said, like put it together with a way that you feel like is going to share that story um, in in the way that is most powerful. Does that answer your question, Sharon? Yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, because, yeah, and especially because for each component, you know, we're looking at um, different groups of people being involved, including students. Um, and so being able to tell, to just tell it as a story um, and how we see it progressing. Um, that's a and that's really important to I uh, share and I just want to add because we're focusing on construction projects that there are components of construction projects that we'll want to see that you've thought about like in particular the the planning and design like so that 
Mm -hmm. either that you have a design for that boardwalk, for example, and that that you have the permitting in place or you are this is the process you'll use to get the permitting. So we wouldn't want to see like build a trail system as one line in your in your project plan, because like we want to make sure that you've taken the steps that that you need to to go through with that. So like Lauren said, there's like that balance between we don't want we don't need to say like I am going to call this person and then I'm going to talk to this person. And right. you know, we don't need that, but we want to we want to see that your project, particularly mm-hmm. in implementation, is ready to implement once yeah. you get the grant agreement signed. And so call out yeah. those things that separate. Like if you're in wetlands, we know there's like call that out. If you're on upland, you don't need as much permitting. So we right. that doesn't yeah. need to be called out. Yeah, no, we're we're fully fully permitted, and um, it's all, and we have the site map and everything's approved, and we're Act Two Fifty and on all of it. So I'll just be really clear about that. Um, I had another quick question. This may sound really silly, but I just want to be clear on it. Um, with the landowner permission, as since we own the land, do we need to submit that? No. So if you <laughs> own the land for anybody who's doing construction and give you, your organization, your township owns the land, you do not need the landowner permission forms. The okay. landowner permission forms are only for land that you are working on that you do not own. And if there is a part of your project where you're like, well, we own this part, but this part is ha- is somebody else's, you will need to provide landowner uh, that uh permission form for those components for that other pieces of land. But if you own 100% of the land that you are working on, there's no need to submit that. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank next you, hand I see is from Maddie. Hi there, yeah, this is Madison Shropshire from Madison County Regional Planning Commission and I have Stan from the town of Cornwall with me. Um, I think between Brett and Sharon, we got most of our question answered, but I just wanna clarify for our situation, Um, Much like Sharon, we have a big project with lots of component pieces um, and we have quotes and designs for all of those component pieces. We have a design for the overall layout of the property, but we don't have an engineering um, site grading plan for the entire property. Is that um, kind of a big obstacle for the implementation grant? And can we include that in our eligible work plan if it's necessary? I'm going to tag in on this one. So just to clarify, is the engineering plan required for construction? So we we don't have a grading plan to kind of comprehensively look at all of the pieces of the project yet. We have a scope of work built to ask for that plan. Um, but we're trying to decide if we need, if we should wait until after we've applied for the VORIC grant or if we should move forward with that separately. So individual components of the project could be built without this, but we want to make sure that, you know, water runoff isn't going to disrupt one piece because we built the other. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you have the permits yet or not? We're working on those two. You're working on them currently? Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you have almost everything is what you're saying. (laughs) Um, that's, that's a little tricky. So like our, our general eligibility is that like planning tasks are not eligible under implementation. Um, however, you know, if you have 90 percent of it and you can't get something done because it's winter now it was seven degrees at my house last night you're not going to dig into the ground right now um we we will take that into account and um if if it's possible for you to get it beforehand and you have the funds to do it like that would make it easier um because it isn't technically an eligible expense if it's not possible and you want it request funds um we can always say like we'll pay we'll pay for everything but this element of your budget um so i wouldn't not apply because you have one more thing that you need um but 
just note that is that you acknowledge that is a planning expense that and and tell us if you can do it without the grant or if you can't. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. And thanks, Maddie, for that question. Next up, we have a question from Belle. And you're on mute, so. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I'm Belle McDougall, and uh, I live in Waterbury Center. And today we're joining the this uh, informational session um, with another person on our skate park coalition, Tammy Bass. And um, we we are looking again at a VoRec opportunity in the implementation track to build um, a new skate park because recently we had to take down our skate park in Waterbury Center. So we're going to build back better. It was 12 years old. So we do, I think the last answer actually answered some of the questions that, I, that we had uh, because we've raised uh, a lot of the money to build the new skate park, but we still have some fundraising to go and wanted to, um, we saw a great opportunity with the, the VOREC grant. So we want to move forward with the application. We have um, uh, an appointment or we're on the schedule for our development review board on December 6th. So we're, we're working through the permitting um, for the surface water. And we don't have engineered drawings yet of our design, but our work plan and timeline is fully intact. So it sounds like we should definitely proceed and that shouldn't be an obstacle for us at this point. Yes, if those things will be secured by the what we are talking about is like the grant agreement development date. So all of these things that we've been talking about, like if we're going to be ready to sign a grant, we'll need to see these in place by the time we're ready to do that, which is going to be happening in the spring. So as much as you can have in advance of your application, if you have all that information to be able to share as a part of your, your proposal, the stronger that's going to be for the review committee. Um, but there are going to be pieces where we'll say like, yes, you said you were getting this. When it comes time to sign the grant agreement, if you were one of our top ranked grantees, we'll say, do you have it now? Um, so that will be a piece is like there are certain factors that we're going to need to be into play before we do that. And so, you know, not knowing the timelines on these different permits and those projects, it's just something to consider, right? Because the VORIC community grants for construction projects, you will be able to start with these grants when the grant is agreement is signed. But we're telling folks, you'll see it on the website, like plan for June 1st, 2024. That is when you can start and it needs to be wrapped up by December 31st, 2025. And so thinking about um, some of the questions we've had about outstanding permits or processes is just how long does it take to get that? Like if you will have it in place by March, um, that feels like it might be a really a good proposal to be able to say, we're going to have it in place by March. We feel really yeah. confident we're already in the process. Um, yeah. but just think about generalizing it and scaling it out. If there are these factors, as you say, you know what? I don't know if we're going to have it in place by March. Like, yeah. I don't know if that's going to be a place. It's just to think about, like, if the project implementation is where you're ready yet, or do you need to apply for, say, like, the project development track? Because it's going to take 20 grand to get these engineering designs in place. You know, not necessarily for a skate park. Um, I hope I hope you don't spend 20 grand on, on engineering yeah. designs for that. Um, yeah. But to think about that, like, generalizing it for everybody. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. And, and we are optimistic because um, we're in process now. So it's good. It's all good timing. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, the next one I think is coming up from Ann down there is, it uh, looks like Ann Craven. Um, Ann Craven, is that me? Okay. Yes, that's you, yeah. You're, it's your question. Okay, um, we had some computer problems, so I hope I'm not repeating our questions. I'm from Glover, the Glover Recreation Committee, and I have a couple of members here, Michelle and Dominique, and I think Jethro is also on the line, who's part of our committee. Um, so they may have questions too. 
Um, my first question has to do with, we own the land that the, what we're gonna do is enhance the, the recreation park, which right now has a ball field and a pump court. And we wanna add some pickleball courts and a, a really big playground. Um, and so the town owns the land, but there is an easement from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board that the, the property has to be used for recreation. So we really fit into that. But what do we need to get from the board for, for the grant application? That's a great question. I know in the application guidance, we've got some specific recommendations uh, included there in terms of getting the landowner permission forms. So if there is like document that is public record that demonstrates that this land is, is intended for public easement or for public recreation, um, like that's a good piece to pull together. Um, you know, we do have those landowner permission forms that are also posted on the website. I, and I can see there's uh, another question in the chat about those. So I'll come back to that one. Um, but that can be a, a piece to to include if you if you don't have that. But if you already have, say, like signed permission from your town that is for in support of this project that's on town letterhead that says all the same things that the landowner permission form say, and you already have that document invitation in place, you can use that existing documentation. You don't have to use the forms we've given you if you have other proof of landowner uh, permissions, but it must say the same types of information because it can't just be like, for anything that you want recreation on our land, you can do it. Um, because that has come up a few times in the past uh, for different grantees where somebody thought they had basically like universal approval from the landowner. And then uh, the landowner said, I, I didn't approve this specific scope of work. Um, and it gets to be that piece. So make sure that that is aside there. Claire, do you have other pieces you want to add to that? Yeah, I think the so it's really easy if you own the land outright and there aren't any leases or easements on the land. Um, obviously, it will depend on what the lease or easement says. And so if the particular easement from VHCB says like we own the recreation rights, like the public access rights to this property, then you need permission. And there are all sorts of easements like that out there that like public access easements, they own that right to the property. And that's what you're asking us to do is improve the public access. And so we need their permission. If there's an easement that does that says, you know, something else that doesn't have anything to do with that and the town still owns all other rights, you it would be great to just get like a letter of support from the easement holder or something like that. We might not need actual permission. So easements can really complicate things because they can say so many different things because they pull out different rights to land and say this person owns those rights. Well, the the person who owns the land and fee doesn't own those rights. So it really depends on the easement. The second thing that I wanted to mention is that we've gotten now a question about a skate park and about a playground. That's a really big fuzzy area for us because Borek defines outdoor recreation as experiencing the outdoors of a community that directly like the natural setting of the community is directly related to the recreation in that. So simply building a playground or a skate park doesn't qualify. However, we also are looking to reduce barriers to the outdoors. So if your skate park you can show is is teaching people how to, you know, then take their skills to snowboard or to to um surf on like rivers or um, your your playground is like reducing barriers to the outdoors and teaching people how to how to um, be outside be comfortable outside however if it's just a built playground that's not gonna rank highly in the for community grants um, I would encourage you if you're thinking about a playground to to think about natural elements that would like bridge that gap. Um, so like we, we've gotten a number of <laughs> requests for playgrounds. We know that there's a need, but um, currently the eligibility criteria do, does not include just a direct playground um, unless there's a clear 
link to outdoor recreation, link to the natural um, amenities of your town. But it's not impossible. So I do want to acknowledge that. Like, I'll drop a link in the chat here to one of our previous grantees who made that connection. Um, so the town of Ludlow uh, did a skate park. And so if you want to read more about how someone else built those connections, um, be sure to check that out. Uh, I also want to uh, address the question in the chat right now, uh, specifically around landowner permission forms. So if the landowner is part of the project team, but not the lead applicant, you still need the landowner permission form. So in the case of this grant application, the lead applicant is the organization or the entity with which uh, who will enter into the grant agreement with the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. This is the person who is ultimately accountable for the project, who is going to be footing the bill for the project and then seeking reimbursement from the state. They're going to be the ones who are responsible for ensuring that the reports are there. Um, so they are doing the financial management. That is who needs to be your lead applicant. And you might have these amazing core partners, but if they are anyone other than the lead applicant owning the land, you need to be able to show that documentation with the landowner permissions. Um, and we do have a form up there we've tried to make it easy for you to secure those um, and get that but you do need that if it is anyone other than the lead applicant um so Anne, i know we, we've kind of popped off your question there did that did that fully well, answer right. it um i think dominic has a question and then i have a, another one go ahead yeah i have a little bit of a follow-up um so uh, the reason i'm here is that from the playground perspective i was hearing rumors that if that's the uh, where you're going, that it has to be a sort of like a, an approved uh, commercial great playground, that sort of thing. But our, our initial vision was actually more to try to do something that's in keeping with the character and the, and the vibe of a place, meaning uh, building the playground out of a central covered bridge, um, which we would uh, design with one of the local timber frame companies and help them help us build it and erect it. And um, I mean, you know, it could be an educational thing. It doesn't have to be necessarily just a physical thing that ties it to the outdoors, right? We could we could incorporate like some uh, like a little sugar house or some information about that if it if it helps it distinguish it from just your basic plastic and metal playground. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I hear you. And I don't think for us, the limitation on playgrounds is not necessarily the, the structure itself. It's not saying, OK, it has to be a commercial built versus like, say, I, I used to build in my previous career, like nature play spaces, right? So I was like all about the stump jumps and the fort building stations. And so it's not delineating between like those types of structures, it's like how your playground is designed so much as like, what is the purpose of the playground? Like, okay. how does that playground unite the community and think about economic development and unite ideally the outdoor recreation resources in the community? And so it's not necessarily as, it, is it a constructed playground? Is it a different design? But like, what is the draw and how will that advance the outdoor economy in your area? Uh, because what we're going to be looking through is through um, a lot of the information that's posted on the website already. We're looking at, you know, the Vorek pillars. That's a huge part of the application is how does your project connect to the Vorek pillars? That's a that's a significantly weighted part of the components. Um, the other piece that will be there in any track that you choose. So we're talking about construction today, which falls under flood recovery, implementation, or um, outdoor equity can ha all have construction projects. But each of those different tracks has different questions related to it. I strongly suggest if you haven't checked out the online application preview, we have a Word document that you can download that has all of the application questions in it. But it'll show you the priorities for each of the tracks. And then it's going to say every track has the thing of how does your project match these priorities? And so that's the story it is that we really want you to think about how to tell. And I'm going to drop another link in the chat here. Um, 
for folks who are just thinking about playgrounds, uh, we actually administer an entirely different program that is just supporting um, recreation infrastructure. Uh, and that is the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It has some other pieces too. Um, we don't have the dates yet, but we're working on finalizing dates for an open round of proposals in 2024. Um, so I put that in the chat. So if you're trying to think like, is the, the Vorek Community Grant the right fit? You'll have that as an alternate opportunity. Okay, that, that's helpful. And so um, did you have one more quick one before I go to the next question? I, I do, I do, Lord. Um, the reimbursement system, could you say a little bit about that? Um, do the bills have to be paid and then submitted to you? Yes. How it works? And, and, and we do recognize that this is a challenge, especially for smaller nonprofits and smaller municipalities, um, smaller entities in general for anything, uh, is that VOREC is a reimbursement grant. Uh, and so what that means is that you have to spend those funds, document the, the spending of those funds, and then seek reimbursement. You are eligible to seek reimbursement uh, roughly once a quarter um, as a grantee, and your grant agreement will include all the provisions that you need to, to, to show with that, of like, what do you need to submit exactly? Um, but you can submit roughly once a quarter for that. That is the max number, max frequency it is, but you need to be able to basically front all of those costs, and then you'll submit your reimbursement request if you're awarded. And then um, we are acknowledging, for, you know, like once the reimbursement request comes in like we have to review it we have to check it it has to go to the business office it has a, like a couple more steps on the way um we get it out to you as quickly as our as we can but realistically that is four to six weeks from when we get it um and so uh, we are trying to do that but that just is something to be aware of for this project and also like your organization's readiness and capacity to lead it and how big you can go thank so, you yeah you're welcome and with thank that you. the next question is to nicole Hi, thank you. Sorry to beat this land owner permission to death, um, but what about a deeded right of way? So um, this is on behalf of a municipality and they have a deeded right of way that the trail will be following along. Would you still like to see landowner permission for the land holder, even though there is a deeded right of way? I'm going to tag Claire in on this one. If you can't tell, Claire is all things uh, the landowner permission right here. Yeah. Um, so the thing with right of ways is landowners don't always know they exist. And so technically, if you have a deeded right of way, you wouldn't need a landowner permission. But in just because of experiences in the past, we'd really like to see that the landowner knows that this trail is going to be built on the right of way that the town owns. Um, so it wouldn't be a landowner permission form necessarily because they don't have the right to grant permission for a public right of way that the town owns, but it would be really helpful to your application to have that landowner give you a letter of support or just note that you have discussed this with the landowner. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Tom, I'm coming to you next, but I know we've had folks coming in to the call. So this is the part of the call where we spent the first half hour exclusively focused on construction. You can see we still have a lot of questions to go. I want to encourage you to do that. But if you are just hopping on to the call, uh, please use the raise hand icon and that'll put you in our queue uh, so we can call on you and or drop your questions into the chat since we have not had any lulls in conversation. Uh, so that's how we can go. But Tom, it's up, to, up back to you. And you are muted. I'm a Zoom guy, not a not a Teams guy. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. This having it like office hours for folks to come and do this. It's it's unique, and and I hope you continue to do it. I've got some several quick questions. It's all around title work or purchasing a property. We don't intend to do the title work until after you folks deem that we're eligible. Uh, and and. The questions in here ask, say it's like 1,200 or 2,500 characters. Mine are maybe 50. So I just want to read my answers to you and you tell me if I need to go more. All right. So uh, describe how you intend to inspect the title and demonstrate that the property is free of title defects. When notice of award of ORAC funds are announced, Berlin will retain legal counsel to inspect the title and determine if there are any defects affecting marketability. 
Yeah, that sounds great. So that, that's true for any of these. Like we have given you a maximum number of characters. We have not stipulated any minimums. I would say if that is your level of response to how do you meet the priorities, build it out more. But for any of the other questions that are coming up, you know, it really we've given a lot of variation in space because there's a lot of variation in projects. Like the answer you shared, short, sweet, to the point, tells the story. That's great. Um, but there might be some other we've left additional space because for other projects, it might be more complex, like they might have more steps. And so we wanted to provide that opportunity. Um, but so please don't feel like you ever have to. And this is true. I'm sharing this for everybody. Don't feel like you have to fill the characters. This is not one of those like they who write the longest get the most. Um, we're trying to figure out like truly the content of the story and what is most relevant. So did you have another one, Tom? I don't. I think you answered just I, I did, but you've short and sweet. So that's what we're going to do. Thank you very much again. Awesome. Great. Thank you for this format. Yeah, thank you. Ethan, uh, you're next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan Murphy, and I'm with the Middlebury Skate Park Project and uh, trying not to get too discouraged by Claire's previous uh, comments, but we're, we're hopeful that our, our narrative will um, sell the fact that if you're if you're out, you're in, and skateboarding and other wheeled sports uh, uh, do that well. And um, I just had a question about the design and build process uh, for something that might go to RFQ or RFP for a project like ours. Um, we have all the the permits and process, but uh, that is something that's unique to skate parks. Is that each one is unique uh, and the design process is usually uh, um, part of the hiring process with the with the build so just wanted to check in on that with design build projects for implementation um, it's a it's a finite uh, time frame once once they're once you pick a a partner um, it, they just go, as, as you all know, from Ludlow. Uh. Yeah, that's a good question. Claire, I could see your wheels turning on that one. So um, you said you have your permits in process. So um, what that says to me is that you'll have parameters in which the design and build would have to happen. You know, with a surface water permit, they'd say you can cover this amount of ground or you'd need to do this remediation for this much concrete. So if if that's the case with with skate parks that you don't get a design and then quote out the design, you like quote out like here is a skate park and here are the elements we want. Um, just explain that to us and say like here's what we're going to quote out if we get this grant, right? Like tell us what it is that you know and then obviously the designer builder would you know make it into whatever they would design and i think we'd be fine with that but just explain to the ranking like the people who will be ranking will just need to know that so you can't just tell me and lauren today you have to say in your application like here are the elements that we will request and this is why but the how that how it is designed in in skate park design is is built together and then we can as long as you like can like get those permits and like you know those parameters beforehand that will be important great um yeah we're we're applying with the town of middlebury so um there's an existing stormwater in process for uh 10 000 square feet and we're only looking to build 7500 square feet so um for the Excellent. Well, glad we can answer that for you. Uh, it looks like Walker, you're our next question. Great. Uh, hi, y'all. Thanks for putting this on. It's really helpful. Um, I'm calling in from the Smoky House Center. We're a nonprofit down in Danby, Vermont, and we're applying for an implementation grant. We've got a 5,000 acre property here that has an existing trail network, but it's it's really hasn't been maintained in over a decade. So we're kind of looking to revitalize that and make it a lot more accessible for folks. I have a really quick specific question. I hope it's very easy to answer, but 
with that old trail network, we have a bunch of culverts that exist but need replacing. And then we also have a boardwalk over a series of beaver ponds that also exists but needs quite a bit of updating. I think I read we do not need Act 250 permitting for that. Does that sound correct? If we're keeping the existing footprint, um, I'm going to encourage you for any permits, if you're doing any construction, this is something you'll see in the application, is that you'll have to do the permit navigator guide. Um, and so okay. it will tell you what permits you need. You know, Claire has mentioned several with, you know, surface water or there's this one or that one, like go and do the permit navigator report and it's going to tell you what are the things to think about. Um, so that that's definitely going to be a piece. Uh, and for anybody who's doing permit navigator, there is a checkbox. They actually like put it in there three different times of like, do you want a jurisdictional opinion? If you do not want a jurisdictional opinion, AKA you don't want what you put in there to be sent to staff to review and actually like give a final decision on, on whether you need a permit, do not check the box. Uh, you can go through there just uh, basically as a guest. I did it to test it. You can go through it as a guest, still get the report print out that you can have to understand that and that isn't in a binding kind of a way. Um, so I suggest that you do that as a piece just to start to think about that. The other piece that comes to my mind um, is a question that we've had about the Boric Community Grants is, uh, and this might not be your project, but if you were hearing the pieces about uh, playgrounds and skate parks, uh, and we're saying, okay, make sure you connect it to the bigger outdoor economy in your area. The same is true for trails with the Vorek Community Grant. You need to do that. If it is a simple trail grant, knowing that trail work is never simple, we actually just released yesterday uh, the pre-applications for the Recreational Trails Program. Um, so that is an entirely separate grant program that is just about trails. Um, so that is true for, you know, if it applies to your project or anybody else on the call, if you are, it's it's for municipalities, nonprofits, and other governmental entities, including like tribal organizations or, or regional governments. Um, that opportunity is available uh, and we just posted the information yesterday. Pre-applications for that are due December 30th. Um, so did that answer your questions, Walker, and then some? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to do a, also a plug. Um, so well, first, like, although there is the RTP program for like a simple, simple trail project, if if your project does have a trails that connect to a, a downtown or to your your location and you're doing programming at lo your location that's added to the trails that is a fit for Vorek as well so like we will have trail work as part of a Vorek grant it just can't be the only thing that you do is doing a trail unless like the trail is like building a trail that connects a community park to a school or something like that um but I just want to you mentioned the culverts that needed to be replaced as you guys all know, we have a flood recovery um, uh, track for um, assets that were damaged during the floods of last year. But if your assets weren't damaged, but you still know that you need new culverts because you just got lucky this time, um, please note that. And we are very, very, very willing to upgrade. Um, so we, like if you are having an expanded trail system as part of a VORA grant, please say, here's why we are we are asking for this much more money because we want to like right size the culverts or build bridges instead in certain situations um, to make it more resilient. Um, resilience and and natural and, and environmental conservation are priorities across all of the tracks. And I just want to emphasize like going forward, like of all the things we learned last summer, it's like we need to um, have better water structures. So culverts, bridges, please be thinking about that when you're submitting your grants. Thank you. Jennifer, you're up next. Thank you, and thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. The project that I'm working on is with the Green Mountain Conservancy and we're down in southern Vermont and there is a piece of land which has come up for sale. It's about 200 acres. There are actually three different owners of a family and 
<clears throat> it's next to the former Marlboro College land, which is about 500 acres, and which is now owned by Potash Hill Inc. And what we're working on is, uh, so that 200 acres is landlocked, if you will, but Potash Hill has been very generous about letting people use that land and use the trail. Um, and also the, the owners of the land have been very generous about that. And so we'd now like to codify that and have a very small uh, parking area, which Potash Hill has agreed to, and a small walking trail that goes into the main trail system. There's a group called the Marlboro Nordic Ski Club, which uses those trails and lots and lots of young kids are now, and we're just so excited about the exposure that they're getting. So it would be Green Mountain Conservancy applying. Um, what I'm really excited about is the idea of, of requesting some from the Vorek grant for land acquisition. We put in a large grant application uh, to VHCB um, and we a couple of other entities as well. And we're gonna do private fundraising. And then uh, the Vorek would be for a small amount of the land acquisition and the tra building of the trail across Potash Hill and, and the uh, parking area. And at the parking area, the owners of the land would really like to honor their grandparents who started Marlboro College and um, their family have stewarded the land. So there would be some, we're hoping that we could put in for Vorek for that signage. And um, also one of the three family members is really interested in thinking that she said, well, we weren't the first people there. The indigenous people were the first people who used that land. So we're finding out more about that and having a land acknowledgement that would also be part of it. So in my mind, it's a nice package, but I could also see how it could be viewed as a bunch of different things. And so I just wanted your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the, the the thing that makes the Vorak Community Grants different from the RTP grants is that RT, the Vorak Community Grants give you a chance to tell that community story. Like that's what it, these grants are about is like bringing together all of these different elements to build that outdoor recreation economy. And so like that actually is a much better fit for the Vorak Community Grant than it would be for just an RTP grant, it, you have a better space to tell that story. Um, the only thing that gave me pause on this, and it's just something to be sure to, to hear in your application, Claire might have other pieces, is that you mentioned that the land is being sold. That it is a piece that like, thinking about all these conversations we've had around land owner permissions, has been a piece you know we've had folks who say well we're going to build a trail but we don't own it yet um and it's saying okay well we're going to own the land like can you prove that you're going to own the land when will that land sale be complete to be able to ha say like we are the landowners by the implementation date uh because there if, if there's that pause that's gonna that's gonna throw some wrenches in if you're like actually the sale didn't go through till august of this, you know, this upcoming year, you know, I hope that's not the case, but if the sale doesn't go through to August, that's really going to impact your implementation time window. Um, so that would be the, the piece that gives me pause is just to think about how landowner permissions are going to play through with that potential transfer of property. Yeah, I would just add to that too, Lauren, it sounds like you, no matter what, will need landowner permission at, at the Marble College property. And one thing that might help your application is to show that that element of the project is valuable no, no matter what happens with the land acquisition element of the project. Um, so that's like one thing to tell that story. So like we can say like you are ready to put in the parking lot and the kiosk and the memorial and the walking trail. And then we also could, you know, partially fund a land acquisition that's that qualifies under project implementation. Um, so then, but, you know, that land acquisition should happen before December 31st, 2025. So <laughs> that's like, and if if that's right possible, this. like we know about land acquisitions, like don't worry, like we, we know how they go. Um, so like 
we know that there could be something that throws a wrench in it, right? And we'll just write into the grant agreement, you know, if these things don't go through, like that part wouldn't be eligible. But just like make sure that it's not reliant on something that's like slightly in flux, like that land acquisition. That's so helpful. And and just so you know, the we're finalizing the purchase and sale agreement as we speak. And it's for October 2024, um, the end of October. And so, which is far out, but we feel like we need that time. We're working with the Vermont River Conservancy on a conservation easement. And um, so that's really helpful. Well, one question I had sort of related to the land acquisition was um, the reimbursement element of it. You know, I think with, for example, VHCB, if we were to be funded by them, we were sort of looking toward having the money and then purchasing the land. But it sounds like this would be somehow us purchasing the land and then getting reimbursed. It is. These grants are exclusively reimbursement based. We don't have any kind of cash advance that's built into the grant Perfect. program this year. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Drew, you're up next. Hey, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I was excited to hear about all these projects uh, that people have in mind. It's really exciting. Um, I, as you know, wear several hats. I'm asking from a BRPA, Vermont Recreation and Parks Association hat, and it's about the equity track, so I wanted to keep it to the end. Um, but we were looking at um, uh, making that a, a focus of our conference, as well as perhaps several of our events. We were thinking of um, asking for things to support equity um, kind of programming throughout our entire calendar year um, and, you know, scholarships as well and a couple of different things. And we we're wondering, is that something, is it better to focus on one thing um, or is it okay to kind of propose something that would be um, more like a year long program where we implement um, kind of uh, throughout the year? That's a good question. And I would say in general, you know, it doesn't have to be a one and done opportunity. That does not what the Vorek Grant Community Grant has to be focused on, especially when it relates to that outdoor equity programs. So, like it doesn't have to be that. I would say though, if you are combining multiple elements, how do they all build and complement each other? It's gonna have to feel like it's a holistic project and not it's the three things that were on your wish list that you've just been trying to get funded. And, and I just say that like as someone who you who who wrote a lot of grants, it's like sometimes like there's that really natural piece of like they all go together and this is how all of these different parts are going to happen. Um, for the outdoor equity track in particular, um, I strongly, if you, I Drew, I know you've been on a couple of these calls already and I mentioned it, but that the application is something that I, I recommend you look into because, you know, each of these, uh, as I mentioned before, each of the tracks have different questions of the outdoor equity track. Like there is a piece in there about like who are those partners and how does it kind of shape together Together. Like, how does it, how does it, how are they engaged and involved? And so for something like an association to say, we are doing this for, like, who else is with you? Um, that's going to be an important part of the conversation there is like, who else is a part of that? And how have they shaped the proposal? And how have they been engaged? Um, that's been something we've been talking with the Office of Racial Equity about a lot is like how we can evaluate that through the proposals that are there. And so there is that big space to talk about those partners. And so to, to really like, Pull that and, and have that be a big feature as you're bringing it all together. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's super helpful. Um, the other thing I would add is um, we can't we can't do pass through grants and scholarships are pretty would be pretty difficult as well. So um, and the reason for that is when we sign the grant agreement, we need to know who is getting the funds. Um, and how they're going to use them. So it is a limitation, especially with the equity track of, you know, we acknowledge that funding can be a barrier. Um, and sometimes it's just funding, like a scholarship that would, would make it possible. Of course, like we can say like reducing the costs of a program, for example, rather than giving individuals scholarships. There, you know, there's ways that we can do it. So if you have an idea of about a scholarship or that sort of thing, like please reach out to us so we can frame it in a way that's actually eligible under like state contracting rules. 
Um, so that's just something to think about. And like mini grants, like running a mini grant program is is not going to be possible for us right now. That's super helpful. That helps us know about that scholarship element. Um, we do have that already as part of our programs. And our hope was to make like volunteer commissions, like some folks on the call have more access. Um, but if we are able to, um, we can use our, continue to use our funds for that. And then, you know, that's really helpful to help refine like, what should be in and, and out. Um, so yeah, super appreciate that. Awesome. Uh, Britta, I think yours is next. And we can't hear you. I see that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. If you can put it in the chat, maybe we can try it that way. And while Britta is prepping this, we have five minutes left. This has been a nonstop questions, and we know we're probably not going to get to them all today. So we're going to keep going as much as we can uh, till the end here. But if you do have lingering questions, um, I'm going to drop our email address in the chat. Please email us. That is what our recommendation is uh, for the next step. So if you have follow-up questions, please email. We are trying to get back to emails as quickly as we can. Generally, it's within a, a couple days at most right now is what we're trying to get to because we know there are questions are time sensitive. So we want to continue this going. Um, but Bridget, did the audio work? Not yet. Not yet. If you're able to put it in the chat, we can go from there. We just heard some noise might have worked, Britta, if you want to try saying something. Oh, there we go. OK, yeah. you can hear Yay! me. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for holding this. This is great. Um, I'm Britta. I'm I'm with the Blueberry Hill Outdoor Center, and we're hoping to apply for an implementation grant. I have two hopefully quick questions. Um, the first one is about letters of support. Um, and I guess just like generally wondering if you could say a bit more about what you're looking at for there, but more specifically, if we've applied for, we applied for a building communities grant, and we've applied for Vorex stuff in the past, do you wanna see new people or can we reuse? Um, and then my second question, I'll just throw it out there so you have both, um, is about the sort of, who's your project team question? We're a pretty small organization and like almost exclusively volunteer led so we would really want to hire someone to be a project manager for this if we were to get it and i'm just curious whether you'd want to see that person already be kind of on board or have a few suggestions for that person or whether it would be okay to just say like we know that we need someone who's paid who's not volunteer to to manage this yeah that's a great couple of questions uh i'll take the the letters of support first uh, piece. Uh, and so as someone who is new to managing grants within the Vermont, uh, within uh, FPR, I'll also say that like, I don't know about your past letters of support, like who has signed on to your grantees before that. Our reviewers aren't going to know that either. So there shouldn't be really any difference in terms of like, oh, these are the people I'm always working with and I have long and established relationships with versus like, we need new partners for this um, because they won't have that historical record. Um, like the review team won't be looking at that. In terms of what we're looking for with this, um, you know, for implementation grants, in particular for letters of support, is uh, really that commitment of who's going to be involved with the project, um, maybe outside of your 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 uh, outside of your entity, um, could be a big piece to include. You know, for the outdoor equity track, we have that question come up, and we're like that's at, we're actually looking probably for some different letters of support for that. You know, like that type of uh, project, we want to see like some of the most powerful letters are not going to be from like your non nonprofit partner who's doing this with you because you can talk about them in the project management component of the application like you can talk about those pieces those people who are going to be there and so if you have that opportunity like if there are people who are going to be in
impacted by your work, who can really like make that case and that really share their story of why this is important and why they're with you and value it. That's going to really strengthen your proposal too. So even for your implementation grant, if you do have some of those potential storytellers who can help to make that case, like those are going to be some of your strongest letters of support. Um, the generic boilerplate, I agreed to do the work that said I was going to be in the scope of work. Like that is valuable and that is an important, but it just if you do have that alternate opportunity because the letters of support are limited, it's going to make a stronger case statement to help tell your story that way. And then in terms of the project management team, like that side of the actually I'll pause. Claire, did you have anything else to add for letters of support? OK, uh, for the project management part of the application, that is your space to use to say, who are, you know, who is going to be doing this work? Uh, and so if you don't have that person in place yet, we recognize that like you probably need money to be able to hire somebody. And if you're going to go through an open review process, is it going to be a bid with a contractor to tell us the story of how you're going to find that is going to be the important thing. And like, what are the key characteristics of what the person you're looking for? You don't have to necessarily have selected a candidate to say we're going to hire a staff, but it is different, right? It's fundamentally different to say we're going to hire a temporary staff member or, you know, a term limited position who's or even a contract for us versus to say we're going to contract with this other firm who does project management um, and so tell us the story of like why it is and then share how they're going to be involved who else is going to be involved like those kind of relationships and also why it makes sense for you right like you said we are an all volunteer organization like that right there to lead into and this is why we're hiring someone to do the work um, makes a more powerful statement than just oh we're going to hire somebody for anybody who doesn't know your organization and I would just add, we've said this in other calls as well, but if you're anticipating hiring a contractor, we strongly recommend reaching out to a couple contractors to get an idea of prices um, so you can put that into your grant. Um, that's something that, you know, people know um, is expected. And so, like, we want to get, you know, we have one chance to to get it right in terms of your budget and so like we want your budget to be as realistic as possible we can make amendments if something comes up but like things like you know costs of of gravel have like gone up a ton in the last six months um that's something that we would maybe have to make an amendment for if that would happen again but please don't use um cost estimates from last spring, like for any kind of construction project, those are not gonna be accurate. So um, take the time in the next little less than a month to get those estimates um, as accurate as possible because it's a lot harder, you know, now it's a lot easier to change those numbers than it will be six months from now when we're signing grant agreements. And it is okay to add anticipated raises in cost into your budget. That's been something we talked about to say like, well, we got costs that all said it was going to be a thousand dollars, but we want to budget eleven hundred just to be safe. Like that is something that you can do is to budget into an in anticipated uh, inflation of cost uh, for anything. We are a little over our hour. Maddie, I see the question is there. I'm going to be happy to stay on and continue answering this, this question that we've got. Um, but for folks who have to hop off, you know, you're welcome to do that. We will be sharing the recording afterwards and, and have a great rest of your day. But Maddie, I, I just want to acknowledge we are over time, but I'm happy to stay and, and get your last question answered. Yeah, thank you. Stan, take it. Uh, we have a uh, outdoor recreation project that has many components in it. One of the components is a walking trail that's going to be primarily used by the uh, contiguous school to this uh, recreation area. It's also going to be used by a geriatric walking group. The ages are 75 to 95. The question is, the trail system is a component of a larger project. I noticed that we have the Recreational Trails Program Fund available for application by the end of the month. Is it possible to include the trail system as part of the application process for the VORAC 
and the recreational trails program? That is a great question. And the challenge of this is that there are two different sets of pots of money operating on two different time levels, or like two different time scales in terms of when we're gonna be reviewing them and coming to that decision. What I would recommend to do is to say like, is there are there components that you can bisect that project and say, well, we're gonna put part in the VORAC and part in the RTP. And if like you just got RTP funds or just got VORAC community grant funds, both of them would be successful. Like, can you divide your project in that way to make it, you know, so if you get both, great. If you only got one or the other, your project would still be successful. Um, I would hesitate to recommend you duplicate your efforts um, just because they have different questions and even different requirements. Um, and I think that that could be challenging for you to say, oh, do we pick, you know, we're going to hear about VORAC first, and that is state funds. So there's different compliance requirements for that. Do we sit with that one or like, do we hope that like we get more money from the RTP program and then have to do federal requirements? I think like for if, it, if it's truly like a meshed project, I might just pick one or the other, or if you can try to separate them, you could apply for both that way. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I would just add that, um, one of the benefits uh, we rearranged, reorganized how we do grants, and so the Lauren is um, facilitating all of our outdoor recreation grants. In the future, we're going to spread them out, so questions like that don't happen. We we couldn't this year for a variety of reasons. If so. Lauren's first choice of like having if there's like component like clear components of each that like would stand alone um, is the most ideal. It's a, gonna it's gonna be a lot of extra work because of the timeline with RTP. If you if you apply for the VOREC and put the whole thing in VOREC and you apply for RTP, you'd have to do a full application of RTP before you'd find out about Vorex. So you'd have to do all the work in applying. Um, however, if it's so intertwined and that you really just want to get that walking trail in um, and you want to, like, we don't want to take away the opportunity for you to do that. We're not saying you can't apply for both. It will be a lot of extra work because of that overlapping timeline. And so, just know that if you if you apply for VORAC, you're going to have to put a whole different application in for RTP. You're going to have to do the full application, not just because it would be really great if you could just do the pre-app and then we would know if you should go forward or you should rescind your application after that. But unfortunately, the timing is not going to work. So and this was because of federal funding restrictions. So we had to do this timeline. Um, so if you are willing to to put in that extra work, it is okay if you would hear from Vorek that you got the funding and then you take away from the RTP. Like we're not gonna like say that that is bad in any way. We're just acknowledging that that is a lot, like a significant lift to fill in that extra application. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Like so, first choice would be to like have two different things that stand alone. Um, then it's like really up to you of like how much effort you'd want to put into repeating an application. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your questions and just your interest in this program. It's been really exciting to see uh, the amazing ideas that are coming out of it. And we look forward to getting your applications in December. Um, so thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. And just Thank one you. more thing, we have one more open office hours. That's just an open hour um, in two weeks. And so if you have any last questions, um, feel free to join that. Um, we're expecting that to be like, hey, wait, I forgot about this question in the application. Um, hopefully just like the last minute type questions and not any big substantial ones, hopefully. Um, but and then, of course, as Lauren said, if you have especially small follow-up questions, feel free to email us. All right, and with that, we're gonna sign off. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you.